managed to tame the beast of technology. Uh, so hopefully you can see exactly the same as what I'm seeing here. Um, and what we're going to be doing is creating a new beast, a new beast of sound. Um, I'm going to give it some form of memory. It's going to be able to uh, essentially record in what's going on through this microphone here. Um, and then we're kind of going to develop a system where it plays that back. Um, and then there will be some form of battle between me and the machine as we try to tame it. So I'm going to be working in a piece of software called Max. Um, and this is a graphical programming environment. Um, and you can see these kind of blocks on the screen. All these blocks are called objects. And in computer programming, we call up certain functions. So like any language, certain words, and it means that object will do something. Do something useful or not useful, as the case may be. Okay. So the first thing, um, in terms of connecting together on, on here, uh, you can see all these different cables as well. So if I just connect that, then that connects straight through to that speaker, and I just need to turn it down a little bit. Okay, so we don't get feedback. Connect it over to that one. Uh, then that should come out of that right speaker. Yes, yes, yes. Is it coming out? Brilliant. Uh, excellent. So it is working fantastic. Okay, so Max can be used for loads of different applications. Um, it's, it's kind of like a framework where you build and construct ideas. Okay, so we can use it for sound installation, video installations. Um, we can actually create sound with it and record data. Equally, we could use any of those to control other aspects. It's a great kind of centre in of connecting together different technologies. So we could use gestural controllers uh, to control sound or music, uh, or I could stand here and dance and use a body sensor um, and map all my movements um, to again sound, music, video, or just generate data. Okay, we could generate web pages from my dancing. It'd probably be pretty shocking, but we can certainly uh, do that. So the first thing I want to do is to create uh, this whole idea of memory, long-term memory. Okay? Um, and to do this, I'm just going to type in uh, SF record, which is a recording function. Let me zoom in uh, a touch. Okay? And if it goes off the screen and you can't see what I'm doing, do shout uh, T, B, and then time. So with these memories, I'm going to essentially timestamp them. Okay, with a precise time, we could extend that out um, and think about uh, relating that to the actual day. Uh, we could also go further and take in a feed from, I don't know, what the weather is uh, at this particular time. And again, include that with the actual memory. Because again, if you think about how our brains work, they're kind of uh, these amazing kind of databases of um, experience. So one memory, a sound memory, might be connected to a number of other uh, senses. Okay, in that I don't know, uh, a piece of music might kind of trigger a response uh, to a concert you went to when you heard that music, um, and it's a wonderful experience or a negative experience. So with these kind of memories, we also associate other kind of senses, or a sense of smell as well. And as you recall that, then other. So I'm going to set this up so we just record uh, four seconds, okay, uh, four second chunks, and then we need some way to recall uh, these memories back uh, again. Okay. So we're going to be able to see these men memories appear in this little menu. Uh, right, append, append, uh, connect that up. So each time I go to record, it will add one of those memories. I then need to Play that memory back. So it's just draw it back down again. Okay, so again, these objects I'm connecting up are going to tell whatever object they're connected to do, to, to do a certain job. Okay. Um, so now I'm going to play it nicely here, actually, it's going to up. Click on this button, this will be my first memory. 
Okay. Um, now I need to be able to see that it's definitely recording. But I can now see in this menu here. I click on this button. This will be my first memory. Okay. Uh, there we go. So we've got one memory. First memory for today. Um, what will this uh, creature to do is at the moment. It's, can 20 minutes create a system which recognises what I'm saying. So it's going to basically um, give it the ability to record whenever I start talking loudly. So whenever I get excited, uh, it will hopefully capture that moment in time. Um, and then I'll be able to play it back equally. Uh, we could go the other way if we were more interested in the quiet sounds. Um, we could set it up to do that. Okay. So let's just type in average three. So what this will do is it will uh, essentially give me a value for the dynamics coming in. Okay, now again, this is just a very, very simple way um, how we here as human beings, it's something more akin to this part here on the right hand side. So you're seeing these, uh, basically a spectrogram and a sonogram. Okay, this is uh, displaying the frequency content of my voice. So if I, for example, to go la. spectrogram when I'm saying those vowel sounds. And vowels <coughs> sounds known as kind of formants as a distinct pattern and equally when I'm talking, um, actually although we understand it, sometimes understand it has meaning, actually what I'm saying is just a series of noises, okay, in a specific order, which we've been in some ways brainwashed to understand have actual meaning. But at the end of the day, these are just sounds and to this simple beast here they're purely sounds, it doesn't have any meaning or context. Okay, so I'm just going to take the uh, dynamics and uh, this varies depending on what's going on. So if I just talk louder, uh, it's around 0.25 is when I can start talking louder. Okay, then I'm going to need to add a little bit of extra code on here to make it work reliably. Uh, one of the boring things about programming is you come up with a simple idea um, and then you find uh, you have to kind of add on a whole load of other stuff just to make it work reliably. Okay, so it only records um, basically one memory at a time and then kind of stutter and restart or whatever. Okay. Uh, so that is looking good, he says. So now if I'm to cloud it, it should now record uh, that particular memory. Okay, so as I'm wittering away now, it will keep going to record. Um, I'm going to set that a little bit higher than that to 5. I'm obviously getting overexcited already. Um, and so now we have see, we can see all these memories down here. So at 5.54 and 12 seconds. Now if I talk loudly, it should now record uh, that particular memory. There we go. So it's capturing all these specific moments and timestamping. It's timestamping. Now that's potentially quite interesting because then at some point, I can recall those memories, okay? And we need to develop a system where, well, at what point will we recall these memories? So, I typically find um, whenever things go well, <laughs> whenever I get bored, or let's say uh, all goes quiet, then my mind starts to wander off, okay? So, equally here, we're going to set it up so when the signal on this microphone goes quiet, um, then we're going to get it to recall the memory. Now this uh, sound monster hasn't got an inside voice and an outside voice, whatever it's thinking you're going to hear. Okay? So it's just going to set up another one here, this is basically what's known uh, as an envelope follower, and again ridiculous numbers, uh, 88,000 do. Connect it up, uh, interchange, and now these values should be slightly less, oh, no, around the same, good. Um, and I want to basically give it a little bit of leeway in terms of time. Um, so we're going to say, tell it to play. Uh, and this one, I'm going to tell it to stop. Okay, so this is a little system here. And again, this is another thing our brain does all the time. Um, when you kind of start thinking about it, something uh, will start to do an action. At any point, it can be overridden by your choice. Uh, to do something else or another sound coming in saying don't do it or whatever it may be. Okay, um, Brilliant. So what we should find now is when I go quiet, um, after about four seconds, 
if it's continuously quiet, then it will send a bang out, and then we can get it to recall one of these memories. Now again, thinking about how we recall memories, sometimes there is a connection there. So this is just simple, but obviously if it's more complex, we could look through uh, lots of different kind of meta tags uh, about connections from whatever we're talking about at the time, and your brain might kind of join up um, those thoughts and think, oh yeah, I know, there's certain things happened to me, um, and recall it on there. What we're going to do is just do it purely on time and uh, give it a choice. Okay, now again, choice is another kind of fascinating area for us as humans. Uh, when you go and choose your sandwich at lunchtime, um, how do you choose? There might be a massive sandwich cabinet there, um, and typically I find myself kind of reducing down my options perhaps looking at price to start with, so let's look at the two pound sandwiches um, and then see what the options are there. If there's one there, I'll go for that. It might be coronation chicken is the order of the day. But if I have coronation chicken after four days in a row, then I might start to get a bit bored and it's like, wow, actually I've had that four days in a row, let's go for something different. So this kind of method of thinking is quite logical and uh, it's based on probability, okay? And a lot of um, a hour um, AI algorithms are based on um, probabilistic theory, basically. Okay, um, so what I want here is a little decision system. So this machine is going to make it a decision whether it's going to randomly recall the memory or whether it's going to recall a memory, um, basically the next memory in sequence. Okay, so I'm just going to create a little decision maker and it's really kind of quite simple to do. So uh, it's going to randomly generate a number between 1 and 100 and then the power of it comes um, with kind of a little split. Okay, so it's basically going to have a 50-50% chance of uh, either being on the left or on the right. And as I click this, you see it flashing on either side. Okay, and I can change the weighting of this. So 20% of the time it will be on the left um, and 80% the time will be on the right. Okay. So we've got a decision maker there, I can obviously offer more decisions. And an interesting thing to realise with decisions and how we think of humans is how our past experiences influence uh, our kind of current decisions, okay, based on what happened before. And we could obviously um, develop that um, into this uh, algorithm. Brilliant. So I'm going to basically call up a random uh, memory. I need to find out how many uh, memories I've got before I do this. So just put a little bit of extra code. Connect that up to my list of memories. Okay, so when that gets banked and gets hit, it will then say how many memories it's got. And I'm connecting there. And then on the other system I want is a simple counter system. So if the right hand side uh, gets banged, then it will just go onto the next memory. Reset counter memory immediately and we just go to there. Okay. Um, brilliant. So that should all be set up now. And when I go quiet, uh, hopefully it will work. Let's change. No, that's yes, yeah, just go to a 60-40 split. Uh, good. One last thing I want to do as well. Um, is just set it up. So if I'm quiet for a long period of time, now, if I talk now, it should now record uh, that particular memory. So if I'm quiet for a long period of time, it will then just keep looping around. Um, or whether it's going to recall a memory, um, this is the next memory. So SF play down here, through the game, and that's going to just loop around. So we create a feedback loop, uh, essentially into random, and that uh, Way. And the last one here. Whenever there's sound, it won't be open, and when there is not sound, it will be open. Okay. Uh, so that's all I should need to do for that um, part of it, and that will just. So, I'm just going to create another decision maker, and from a now, there's a fragment of memory coming back yeah. as I start talking. Okay. Uh, they might be interesting. Oh, I'm sorry. 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 So what I'm going to do now is just look at uh, creating another kind of system um, which looks at kind of short-term memories. This is long-term memory. As long as my computer works and this patch is running, it will be able to recall those five years, ten years' time. Okay, and it will be exactly the same slightly distorted uh, sounds you can hear now. Um, but quite interestingly, we can 
Uh, also use something known as delays. Slightly less, so oh, no, just around set. Good. And um, I click on this button. This will be my first memory. Okay. Uh, now, if I talk to that it should now record uh, that particular memory. But I'm wittering away now. It will keep going into record. Um, a little bit higher than 0.25. I'm obviously getting overexcited already. These specific moments and timestamping. It's timestamping. Now, and so now we've. So you can see all these memories down here, so 54 and 12 seconds. With these specific moments and timestamping. It's timestamping. <coughs> now, and at some point, I can recall those memories, okay? Develop a system where, well, at what point will we recall these memories? I can find um, whenever things go well, or whether it's going to recall a memory, um, I see the next memory. So, I'm just going to create a little decision maker and what to do. So uh, it's going to randomly generate a number between 1 and 100 off on the right. And as I click this, you see it flashing on the right side, so looping around um, these. Uh, good. Okay, so now I've got set up uh, a <laughs> delay coming back. He and should uh, start with another one of these. And I'm going to jump in the way now. It will keep going into a call. A little bit higher than 0.25. I'm obviously getting very excited and ready. And at some point, I can recall those memories, okay? Looping around um, these. Right, so now. That's a nice little drive from now to the ball. That's a bit oh, better. So, yeah. right, I'm making sound now. So, I've now set up this delay unit, okay? Which is a kind of short term memory. What it's going to do is it's going to play back sound. Uh, depending on the length of the delay I specify. So if I specify a delay time of 20 milliseconds, then you probably won't really notice any difference between uh, the sound of my voice and the sound coming out of the speakers. Okay, if I rooted the sound all the way through the speakers, there'd be a bit of phasiness, but our ears don't really detect sounds uh, which are kind of separated by uh, less than 30 milliseconds, it's a separate sound, it's even part of the sound itself. Um, as I push this uh, further on, let's go up to around uh, 80 milliseconds, then we're starting to get a slap back uh, coming from this sound. Okay? So there's a kind of distinct kind of echo to my voice, which is kind of quite like confusing to, to, uh, to talk a lot more. Um, and now I'm going to push up to around 300. Okay. So, so this becomes, this becomes actually, actually a bit rhythmic, almost. depending on how, how we're talking. talking. So, so if I try to like this, this, and it turns, and then how we're going to say, say, we'll build, 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 um, what I'm talking about. Okay. Now, now, the other thing with delays as well is we can feed back. And that, and that basically, basically gets these fast sounds out. and then starts to recycle them. And they keep being added to it. And then we can do that. And over 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 So that's kind of, that delay time of around 500 milliseconds kind of becomes rhythmic. Beyond that, if I push it up to, let's say, three seconds, then it becomes a kind of distinct moment in time. So three three seconds later, moment in time. So three seconds later, we start to get this kind of question and answer, like a canonical. We start to get this kind of question and answer, like a canonical system um, happening. We can equally push it further. System had to. We can equally push it further. 
So 15 seconds now. We start to get this kind of question and answer. It's a moment in time. Uh, this is volatile memory. Once it's gone, we don't hear system it. System happening. We can even push it further to. Let's go 15 seconds. And so 15 seconds now it becomes a new distinct moment in time. Okay. Uh, this is volatile memory. Once it's gone, we don't hear it again. Again, uh, this is volatile memory. Once it's gone, we don't hear it again. Five. I'm obviously getting overexcited and ready. I click on this button. This will be my first memory. Okay. Uh, now, if I talk loudly, it should be uh, that particular memory. I'm whittering away now.
got time for questions, observations, criticism. Uh, one thing that struck me was the uh, contrast between what's discernibly your voice and then the abstraction of it, which were essentially yours. And there was a moment when it sort of seemed to switch over, but then it kind of fused back again. Is that something that you designed it? Well, I presume it's the nature of working on acoustic. So when we've got a microphone live, um, it's not just my voice, it's going to be recording, it's also recording the whole environment. Yeah. Um, and so you get bleed through from the speakers as well. Yeah. So you kind of capture on one memory, you'll hear kind of fragments for another memory yeah. or just before this happened. Um, so as it kind of keeps on going and you'll keep recording and resampling yeah. and bringing in the room, if anyone coughs or sneeze, sneezes, that also gets captured into the kind of system as well. Yeah. Um, and I mean, there's a great piece by uh, Alvin Lucia where it actually plays on the resonances of the room, where it kind of recycles the audio round and round and just left with the kind of drone effect of yeah. resonances in specific acoustics. Yeah, yeah. Good, thank you. Any questions, Andy? Dan, I, I mean, I really enjoyed that because I did your performance of Winter Sound. And what I'm interested in is um, if, if you're doing something like this, presumably you've got an idea in your mind about where you're going to go. But I guess you can develop a performance, a live performance, through varying parameters within a fixed, and I don't know what you call this model. But presumably, as you would do in live, you could keep expanding it out forever. And I just wondered if you could talk about that, and if you've done that, and how far can you go? Would you spend the rest of your life doing that competition? <laughs> you know, what would happen? Well, it, yeah, absolutely. And uh, I mean, this is the problem with this type of code, is I lose hours, days, weeks of my life doing things like this, where you come up with an idea and then start to develop that idea. And the problem, I suppose, it applies to anything creative, is you come on cross constant barrier blocks which you get in the way. Um, so I had to practice this to fit it within the time scale, but I've done more extended uh, kind of performances which um, yeah for a long period of time and that's much freer uh, and then I can explore different sounds and uh, get more kind of uh, waves going and create long kind of feedback loops because that's where you get interest uh, within something is creating these textures then sampling those textures and the new today is literally sampling uh, off my voice. Um, but we can, whatever the output is from Max, I can resample that and then use that as a new sound uh, and then concentrate on something else. So uh, I suppose in some ways it's like the old split, spinning plates. Is you get a sound going and then you concentrate on another one, get that one going, and then you can kind of keep adding to it or go back to the original one, take it off, change it around, and um, yeah, again, recycle it. Yeah, we, we, we should try in a couple of days, kind of max hackathon and sound going constantly. Um, but again, the whole idea of improvisation, um, Lamont Young was a uh, kind of pioneer in that with his extended performances, just went on improvising within the actual sound of the environment. Um, and this kind of, this type of technology really uh, hones in on that because we can do the kind of constant drones, but also sample all that sound live and, this whole idea of memory, so if we had a full day performance, we could then reference back to day one quite easily. Um, because we've got, in this system, we've got those on time stamps, uh, start to listen to, I don't know, night time <laughs> recordings and see if they have in there as well. Um, and the other interesting thing um, I kind of alluded to is about this metadata with memories, um, is in a performance, if we have a system which kind of metatags, um, so it starts to, we get systems to listen in a similar way to us, so what we listen to, is it sound, is it dialogue, um, is it music, and then categorising it, or what type of music, is it short staccato, or is it kind of long uh, duration, and then we can call those sounds back and have sections which are based on long, gentle sounds, or loud, aggressive sounds, um, so yeah, it's just a different way of accessing. Um, it's about metadata actually. Yeah. Um, so um, you're talking about memories, and here you know, memories are represented by uh, a, a sound that has a happened at a specific uh, time. Uh, 
and that at the time stamp of that the campus is stored in the memory of this machine here, which is a brain. Mm. Um, uh, I mean, human beings store memories, but they are usually synesthetic. So it means that they they store your, what you re, what you probably perceive of. I've just looked at the cathedral, but you're actually storing the smell and everything at the same time. Absolutely. Is this something that you can basically get that they all these other things which you don't actually acknowledge but actually subconsciously are added to the metadata of that memory of the moon? Is this something that you can embed in this in some way? Uh, it's an interesting one, and I was thinking about this. Um, so if you've got all the right senses, so you've got the smell senses, we've got uh, fairly good visual uh, senses, and obviously oral. Uh, the difficulty comes really when it comes to emotion. And how do we define emotion? So I say, well, if you track my, is it your wedding, or uh, when it's a really great concert, or was a really negative time, really sad time? How do we score, how do we get an emotion sensor for the computer? Um, and yeah, we'll see how that actually works <laughs> out. Um, in one way, you could do it is through when, the, when you're tracking emotions for research purposes, it's very much kind of um, judging people's um, emotions, getting them to write down, or we have a kind of, at a gig, for example, you could have you all with kind of a simple set of emotions. So when it's, when it's making you happy, you can press the happy button on a simple uh, level, and then that gets stored with it. And in a kind of democratic way, an emotion gets stored at that particular moment. But the thing with emotions is all very personal and unique, how many you need to the individual. So, yeah, it becomes a kind of quite interesting area. That's the, the challenge for me with the notion of artificial intelligence, that it can't actually accommodate at the moment anyway human emotion and the subjective position of each individual and each uh, point of view, which is very, very personal. Mm. Yeah. So if you have these options, like immediate feedback, when you have a, like a tinkling button, or I feel a bit bored, but actually no, I feel okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so you, again, just like any kind of research study, you can kind of gauge it to what you want to detect. Um, and then all that information could be timestamped, and you can then match it against what's going on. Um, yeah. And I mean, Kind of these AI algorithms are quite old school. Um, what's more current is machine learning, um, and that's getting the computers to analyze patterns and learn from patterns from data. Uh, it's a bit like data mining, essentially. Um, so if you've got emotional responses from people and you've got a machine learning system, it will start to connect people's emotions to whatever's happening if we're just analyzing sound to the sound. And then you can then tell it, well, this is the type of thing I want, and then it will play something back depending on what level you're using that to act on. Good. Any other questions or observations? Are you going to keep this? You get it, or are you just sort of uh, delete it? No, that will go. Sorry? That will go. It's going to go into the trash bin. Yeah. But uh, what, what, what I find particularly exciting is actually building this series of um, instruments really uh, live. Mm. Um, you could actually take part of it away and then rebuild it. Yeah, absolutely. And I could store parts of it and reuse them. So I'm building everything from the ground up here. Typically, how I work is over a period of time, you start to create what's known as abstraction, so the lumps of code which have got a specific purpose. Um, so instead of building the delay in little bits, I've got a delay, so I can just drop the delay in, yeah. and uh, I've got a surround sound panel, drop that in, and I've got decision makers and um, yeah, things like that, and you can just drop them in and build something more complex um, and speeds up the whole process. Do you think that this software has a particular way that it wants you to get in, or you to use it? Um, Does it have sort of borders? Yeah, you have. Uh, it does, it, well, the borders you find is often down to your own limitations, yeah. rather than the software, but you do come across limitations of the software if you're trying to make it do things it obviously can't do. But the great thing about this whole um, 
kind of experience with this type of software is you build ideas, you create your ideas and realise them using this software. Um, and, and then you can just kind of keep building um, on top of it. So, uh, yeah, good. A rather basic question, I've just started on this, on pure data, and mm -hmm. will pure data be able to do virtually most of that? Absolutely, so everything I'm using here fairly simple in relation to programming. So pure data is developed by uh, David Zuccarelli, who also de developed Max, uh, and he uses just a free version of it. Um, and you'll actually find most of the objects have got similar names um, to tap into it and tap out to it. There's some variation in it, but it essentially does the same. Um, yeah, and there's also got kind of video aspect to it as well. Um, the advantage of pure data <coughs> is it's got huge support around it as well. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it, yeah, it's kind of swings and roundabouts between Max and PD. Uh, offers quite a few advantages about compatibility um, with other software. Um, PD, one of the huge pluses is that it runs on mobile devices. So you essentially create an application and run on your mobile phone. Yeah. yeah, which opens up again lots of possibilities. But you can use Max uh, for not say patches. Is that right? You don't pay for it, you don't have a license. Yeah, so you could download uh, Max today from Cycling 74, it'll run fully for 30 days. And then after that, if you won't be able to save, um, or if you have able to live suite, uh, you get Max for live, which is essentially the same thing um, within a Max for uh, an able to wrapper um, as well. Yeah, or PD's free. Um, I mean, this software actually isn't ideal for this type of performance. You might have noticed when I was copying uh, audio objects or connecting together audio cables, you get a little glitch, the audio drops out. Um, potentially better to use text-based code, but uh, that's even more difficult to get and <laughs> see what's going on because as you're typing the code, it disappears off the screen. Um, with this, you get this kind of graphical layout and you can see how I'm using the buttons and different uh, meters. You can see vaguely what's happening on uh, it. Yeah. On both, uh, what you were doing is a kind of form of live coding, like coding on the fly and uh, creating a texture, and building it up, developing it. And um, I, I, was, I was just interested to see how you were doing that in Max. Because um, I've seen other people um, um, using the, the text pose thing, uh, mm -hmm. so it's a live thing, um, uh, improvising with that. Really. Um, I mean, would you, yeah, I, I think it's an interesting, I think it's a really interesting practice that you've developed. I don't know if this is what you were doing in the concert in Winter Sound, whether you were kind of like building up a patch, uh, a patch on, on the fly to, to create these textures, the, the, the glitch textures, the, the clicks, and you know, the, the, all of a sudden this um, big uh, swarm of clicks that you had. Uh, I remember hearing that from the winter sound as well. Um, how prepared were you for winter sound? <laughs> uh, so, winter sound, uh, the patch for that is something. Uh, I'm just developing as I go along, um, and that had a, a using a machine uh, control interface for that, so less clicking with the mouse. Um, so everything is up and running. Essentially, um, I call up sounds and then start manipulating them. Uh, and the winter sound didn't do any live feed in. You call um, up sound files. I was calling up sound files. I think only about four sound files for that. Um, the version I did at uh, the Turner Gallery, um, I had a live input as well, so you could sample that on the fly and then manipulate that and uh, again re do resampling of textures. So create a, a texture, record that in a sound file and then start editing and playing around with that um, and manipulating it. With this, it was a complete, well apart from a, a little setup, uh, it was a blank canvas and so everything which was generated and created right here. Um, but similar techniques, so you'll note Again, I, I like, love delays and creating textures using delays. Um, and the kind of random cut up towards the end, it's a similar technique of just randomly accessing a file and chopping it up, um, essentially. So yeah, lots of kind of similar techniques, um, but uh, kind of different approach to it. Sure. Thanks, Gary. Thank you very much.